me first of all tell you about, I have recently written this book on, on railway buildings, which covers the period from 1853 to 1953. Um, the reason I wrote the book was, of course, uh, when I went to China for the UNESCO meeting for the Victoria Terminus or CSTM being uh, inscribed as a World Heritage Site, I got interested in, in railway buildings and railway heritage. Traditionally, the uh, railway heritage is associated with steam locomotives. Steam locomotives have a romance of their own and uh, a lot of people enjoy steam rides and studying uh, steam locomotives. But uh, railways has a lot more. And one aspect is buildings, which I have covered in this book that I have recently written. Another reason why I want to celebrate railway buildings is railway buildings, particularly railway stations, are perhaps the most used buildings in India, public buildings in India. Uh, are the footfalls that you, you, you see, for example, at Churchgate Station in Bombay or in any other mainline station all over India are, are amazing. And no other place in the country gets so many footfalls. And the same stations have now been used by four, five, six, seven generations of families and people. So therefore, I feel it, uh, it would be desirable to celebrate some of the station buildings, some of which are, are, are fine buildings. I have a brief, uh, I don't have a brief, it's a fairly long presentation. I will go through it uh, quickly. And at the end of it, we can have a question and answer session. So right, this is the topic for today, uh, Indian Railway Buildings. Um, I have uh, divided the subject into several sort of small bits. Uh, the first portion that I propose to cover is the evolution of, of railway architecture. You know, in the, 19th, in the 19th century, there was a movement of revival of ancient and medieval architectural styles, classical revival, Romanesque revival, Gothic revival. Then we tried to adapt Indian styles into, into buildings. The British tried to adapt that and we got Indo-Saracenic. Then the earlier, early 20th century saw some changes. And I've covered, you know, company head offices and a, a large number of other categories of, of buildings on the railways. Let us see, we'll try and go through all of them. But if we can't, we'll at least cover the portion shown in the blue square. Well, one of the oldest is classical architecture. Classical architecture relates to Greek and Roman architecture, a brief introduction. Um, uh, the difference between Greek and Roman is Greeks had these columns, vertical columns, and there are three orders of these columns. And on, on top of these columns rested a, something called an entablature, which was the horizontal portion. The Romans were very great engineers and they developed the arch. The Romans continued to use the column, but the column became more a decorative uh, element, which gave character to the building. And it, you see that in the, in the uh, photograph to the bottom right. So the five order, orders, the first three are Greek, Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian, and Tuscan and, uh, and composite are the Roman orders. Just to give you some idea what it looks like, Doric, uh, is one of the oldest Greek orders and one of the most common, relatively simple. Ionic is one which has a mollusk or a ram's horn on top, and Corinthian, which has the ac acanthus plant as the decorative element. Uh, in Greek architecture, there is a tremendous amount of vocabulary. You know, the top of the uh, column, this element is called the entablature. The entablature has a cornice, a frieze, and an architrave. The small vertical lines that you see are, are what are called triglyphs. And the triangular portion on top is called a pediment, just by a brief introduction. Now, the finest, uh, one of the finest buildings on the railways is called BNR House, Bengal Nagpur Railway House in Garden Reach in Calcutta. This 
bungalow was built around in the 1840s, probably 1846. It was designed by a city magistrate and its occupants were from 1848 to 1855, Sir Lawrence Peel. And later on, the Nawab of Awadh <coughs> was allocated this estate. And he is said to have stayed there with his entire menagerie of animals, his, his concubines and so on. Uh, um, so uh, he was a great institution in, in Garden Reach. The bungalow is still in use. It is the house of the general manager of, of the Southeastern Railway. The, uh, the, you know, Greek architecture has, 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 has laid down dimensions and proportions. And all of those have been followed in this particular building. Uh, you can see the taper in the columns. You can see the entablature on top, a very proportionate uh, pediment. Uh, triglyphs and so on. So all the elements of Greek architecture are in this building. Another building is what was called Royapuram Station, the oldest station uh, in southern India and in Madras. It was close to the beach and uh, it was built in the classical style. The offices of the Madras Railway were also built there. The, the drawing you see on the bottom right he appeared in 1856 in uh, the Illustrated London News. And uh, uh, you can see the offices building on top, which has got ionic columns. It has got urns on top of the balustrade. Whereas at the, at the railway station, there were uh, the Corinthian capital was used. The, uh, of course, the offices have now gone. There are no more there. The station building is in ruins and uh, it, an effort is being made to revive it by enthusiasts <coughs> in Chennai. Another building is this one in Lucknow, which is, was the headquarters of the Awad uh, Rohilkhan Railway. It was a building acquired by the railways at that time. Uh, this photograph is back from 1874. It appeared in a book called uh, 50 views of Lucknow. And here again, you can see the, uh, the pediment in the center, the Doric columns. And kindly note, you've got Roman arches supported by pillars on either, uh, by, by pilasters on either side. Um, let me tell you what a pilaster. Pilaster is, 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 is uh, half a column. It is more decorative. It can be taking a load, but it is often just a decorative element. So the main element supporting the, the, the structure on top is the arch. And this is a pilaster, a, a sort of half a, uh, a, a column. And this is the rustication that you see, which is normally found in, in, in classical architecture. This is a building in Bombay. It doesn't belong to the railway. It was part of the Port Trust. Uh, it was mold station at Ballard Pair where passengers transferred from ship to, uh, to the train directly. The frontier mail in the old days on nominated days used to leave from, uh, from Ballard Pair. Uh, and you can see this is a remarkable uh, neoclassical building with these uh, columns, the entablature, the triglyphs and something called metopes are displayed here. Underneath the cornice, there is something called gutte, G-U-T-T-A-E. Uh, all, all these elements of Greek architecture are shown here. Um, uh, so it's, it's a very fine building. I don't know what its condition today because I've not seen it for, uh, I've not personally gone to see this building. We now come to the next type. So that was 1850s, 1860s, and neoclassical continues even till today. We then get Romanesque revival. You know, after Rome, Rome collapsed, uh, a lot of the uh, architectural styles was lost. The, the dimensions, the drawings, nothing really remained. The first style that, was, that emerged was called Romanesque. And the characteristics of Romanesque architecture were thick walls because it had to support heavy roofs. It had small windows. 
Roman arches, that is the rounded arch. Romanesque always had the Roman arch, which is the rounded arch. Uh, and it had arcades. It had large towers, which is another element of uh, Romanesque architecture. Uh, it had a particular type of a capital. You know, we had ionic capital uh, there. Uh, Romanesque had a unique type of uh, capital called the cushioned or scalloped capital. And it had, had corbel table below the cornice. You see these small arches here below the cornice. This is called a corbel table. You had blind arcades, that is arches with a wall behind it. And there were symmetrical layouts. Now the finest building of this type in India on the railways is, uh, is uh, Chennai station, Madras Central, what was called Madras Central. So you can see, you can see the thick walls, you can see the Roman arches, you can see the beautiful uh, arcading, very conspicuous towers. You can see these arcuated uh, corbel table. You see this table here, or these small small arches, which are supporting the cornice. Now there's an interesting story about uh, uh, Madras Central Station. There was a dispute which I discovered in the Madras archives between a very famous uh, architect called Robert Fellows Chisholm and the railways. George Harding, he was the chief engineer of the railway. Now the credit for designing the building is often taken by George Harding. All books you see, find you'll find his name. But in actual fact, Chisholm, who was taken for a small part of the work, carried out much of it. The rule in those days was the total cost, uh, the total payment to the architect was 7%. Chisholm was recruited at 2% of the total cost. He later claimed 5% because he said, I've done much more than the work you actually done it. I've done practically the old building. But the railway is then and now is a fairly cussed organization. And they denied him that payment and he, never, and he never got it. But he probably also never did any railway project thereafter. Another building in the same Romanesque style is Agra Fort Station. It's a, it's a delightful building. It used to be meter gauge, now converted to broad gauge. You can see the towers. You can see the blind uh, arches. Uh, you can see the, uh, the corbels below the cornice. Um, although it's a, it's, a, it's a very fine building, it is overshadowed by two massive buildings on both sides, which are Mughal buildings. On its, you, can, you can probably see the red fort of Agra on the right. And this foot over bridge that you see leads to a mosque which was built by Shah Jahan's daughter, Jahanara. It's a magnificent mosque. So, and, and of course the fort is a world heritage site. So it was built here, but it's a fine building, but nothing compared to what is on both sides. The Rajputana Malwa railway offices in Ajmer are also have these towers and so can be described as Romanesque. And the sort of this, uh, the top portion of the tower uh, is really magnificent. It has got clustered openings. And the coming of the railway to Ajmer really transformed the city. The population of the city grew, uh, number of passengers grew, pilgrims to a place called uh, the Darga of Moinuddin Chisti. They started coming there. And the railway, Ajmer became a, a railway town with some very fine other buildings other than this office also. It had a magnificent institute, a, a, a workshop and so on. Another building which has a Romanesque influence, although there are other features also, is Howrah Station, built in 1907. This picture that you see appeared in a magazine in 1907 called the uh, Building Magazine. It has eight towers, uh, six with wide eaves, two with solid square tops. It has thick walls, domes with spikes. It was designed by an architect called Halsey Ricardo. Halsey Ricardo was the, a relative of the famous uh, economist, also known as Ricardo. But he was famous for another style of architecture called arts and crafts style. 
but he, architects who came to India did a lot of experimentation. And this is an, basically, to my mind, an architect's experimental building. We then come to Romanesque led to Gothic revival around the 12th, 12th century. Uh, not Gothic revival, Gothic architecture around the 12th century. And in the, in the 19th century, there was an attempt to revive the old Gothic style. And let us look at what is, what, what is Gothic architecture. So as I said, it evolved from the Romanesque in the 12th century. Its characteristics are use of the pointed arch. In Romanesque, we saw, the, we saw rounded arches. Uh, we see thin walls, large stained glass windows. You can see the central window, which is called a rose window uh, in this cathedral. Um, you, you had flying buttresses, ribbed vaults, towers, uh, spires, pinnacles. And we'll see some of these so that you get a little more familiar with it. And it had a lot of ornamentation in terms of plant and animal motifs, gargoyles, crockets, statuary. And the emphasis was on the vertical. All Gothic buildings are uh, reaching for the heavens. Now, again, <clears throat> typical elements of Gothic architecture. These are spires, pinnacles, flying buttresses, which support the, because walls were thin, they had to be supported. So flying buttress or an ordinary buttress supported the wall. You had gargoyles. You had these uh, decorative elements on the gable slope called crockets. And you had lancet windows with stained glass, beautiful paintings, scenes from the Bible. The majority of Gothic architecture is churches and cathedrals. The most magnificent uh, Gothic building we have in India is this, which is the CSTM, since you are born. Most of you are Bombay based, you're familiar with it. This was a painting done by Axel Hermann Haig in 1878, even before the building was built. Just based on the drawings, this was made. And you can see these spires. Um, uh, you can see these uh, ro rose window. The only difference in this particular building which the architect did, he put a dome on top. Normally there would be a spire here, but he decided to put in a dome. Now, Bombay chose, there was a governor of Bombay, I mean, you, you must know of him, Bartle Frere, who was particularly fond of Gothic revival architecture, and so many of the buildings in Bombay uh, belong to this style. Bombay's uh, Gothic, uh, Victorian Gothic architecture and uh, its art deco Ensemble are now a World Heritage Site. Uh, that building was built between 1878 and 1887. Architect was a government architect, Frederick William Stevens, who did a lot of his homework. He went on a trip to UK before he started work on the building. And it has all the hallmarks of uh, Gothic revival design, spires, turrets, lancet windows, and so on. Only new feature, as I mentioned, was a ribbed masonry octagonal dome. Now, this is some of the, the ornamentation, which is uh, very unique. These are the capitals of some of the pillars. You see the ornamentation, the natural motifs of nature and animals, birds. There are magnificent arcades, gargoyles in various shapes. And in the tympana of the arches, you find some beautiful ornamentation. In this case, it is a, a particular peacock. Now, all this ornamentation work was done by the Bombay School of Art, where Lockwood Kipling was the person in charge, who was the father of Rudyard Kipling. And uh, his best students did most of the ornamental work for this particular building. These are two other features I'd like to highlight. I mean, the finest room is the booking office, which was known as the star chamber, because on this uh, light blue background, you have these stars, uh, beautiful columns. Um, and this is the stairwell, looking from the stairwell up to the dome. 
And you see these beautiful, these are called squinches, which help uh, transition from a, a, a square stairwell into a octagonal dome. So uh, beautifully designed squinches uh, uh, in this case. And you can again see the ornamentation at the, at the bottom of the, of the dome. Another building, same architect, is the Western Railway headquarters uh, of, the, of the Bombay, Baroda and Central India Railway. You can see the south face and the, and, and the west face. Um, Western Railway has traditionally been a more uh, miserly railway. So they were not prepared to spend the kind of money that uh, the GIP Railway was willing to spend on, on, on Victoria Terminus. Uh, so, uh, and another feature was all spires were replaced by domes. And, uh, and in order to get achieve this, uh, Stevens told the management that if you use domes, it will be much cheaper. Initially, they were reluctant to accept, but when, when they knew that they'd save some money, they accepted these domes. So there is an element of Indo-Saracenic in, in this particular building. But otherwise, all other elements relate to uh, 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 Gothic architecture. You see this, this is a square base on which they have developed this uh, octagonal, uh, two tiers of octagonal structures with a dome on top and uh, uh, buttresses all around. This is also part of the World Heritage Site of uh, the uh, Victorian Gothic and Art Deco Ensemble of Bombay. This is another interesting station. The building does not exist anymore. It is Jabalpur Station, old Jabalpur Station. In 1870, the Bombay-Calcutta line was linked at Jabalpur. This was about the time Jules Verne wrote uh, around the world in 80 days. And those of you who have read it will remember that uh, when Phileas Fogg reached this area, there was a gap of about uh, 50 miles and uh, Phileas Fogg uh, and Passport rescued a Parsi princess from uh, a, a funeral pyre. A Parsi princess who was married to a Bundelkhand prince. I had wonderful imagination. Salient features uh, of this building are again, the pointed arch, uh, buttresses, Sorry. Pointed point uh, buttresses, pinnacles. These are the pinnacles, paired columns, and gargoyles. They're small gargoyles here. Delhi Junction Station is also considered a Gothic uh, building because it has towers. It has uh, a number of towers. Uh, but it is not a very, 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 very typical Gothic building. It also uses the pointed arch and it has got these small uh, corbels uh, here. This is a scene of one day before the second Delhi Darbar. Uh, you know, a final coat of paint is being given to the station and the elephants have come. Uh, the Maharaja's elephants are on the right. This is Lord Curzon's elephant, the one on the left. And this one is on which the Duke of Connaught was the chief guest, his elephant. And what is very interesting about this elephant is there were three darbars. The first darbar took place in 1878. And the same elephant was used. It was an elephant loaned by the Maharaja of Banaras. And in this, the second darbar held in 1903. Again, the same elephant. Elephants have long lives. So the same elephant was again loaned and used by the chief guest. Uh, it was a single story building then, other than above the Port Cochere. Uh, and by 1926, the second story had also been built. So you can see the difference. This is about the time that the, the building had been revamped specifically for the Delhi Darbar. Uh, this is another sort of uh, Gothic influence. Kolaba Station doesn't exist anymore. 
Uh, since you are from Bombay, it was opposite uh, Sassoon Dock and uh, in the area which is probably today Badwar Park. Um, uh, and here again, you find uh, these turrets, you find gargoyles, you find lancet windows, emphasis on the vertical. Unfortunately, it had a very short life, the station. It had to be closed in 1930 since the local administration wanted to put in other features, other buildings in, into this area. I now come to Indo-Saracenic. You know, in the 1880s or thereabouts, there was a big debate among uh, architects in India that in order, because these massive buildings that were built were supposed to sort of impress the local Indian population. Now, the debate was whether European style buildings would have a greater impact or whether we, they should bring in some Indian elements into, the, into these large public buildings that were being built. Um, so at that time, uh, it was finally decided to uh, uh, include Indian elements into, into the architecture that was being implemented before you got Indo-Saracenic. And Indo-Saracenic elements uh, incorporated from Indian Hindu and Islamic architecture, uh, chhatris, uh, chajjas, which are sort of uh, uh, extended uh, cornices supported on corbels, the cast arch and jarokas. Jarokas are these sort of harem windows. Uh, and a beautiful, with, with beautiful uh, open work stone screens. So you find all these elements coming into architecture and in railway architecture also. One of the finest buildings is uh, on the railways is Egmore Station in Madras, Chennai. This was the Madras terminus of the South Indian Railway. South Indian Railway was based in Trichinopoly, Turuchirapalli. And uh, they built this very fine station uh, here in, in, in Madras. They say uh, a gentleman known as Arvin, who, was, uh, who propagated this style, he had probably given early drawing, drawings and a uh, architect of the railway called Bird, ECH Bird, gave the final touches. So you can see uh, uh, on a rectangular base, a dome, you can see the beautiful brackets here. And uh, this is a, a fine building, a very fine building, both inside and outside. Another building is Kachiguda Station, the Hyderabad Meter Gate Station. Architect was a gentleman known as Vincent J. Esch, he started his career on the Bengal Lakpur Railway. Uh, in, in Hyderabad, there was a great uh, there was a great flood in about 1910. There was also plague, and they decided to sort of revive the city through an improvement board. And uh, Vincent Esch built three buildings: a station, a hospital, and a school. And in, in this building, you can see he, he has brought in uh, modern precast reinforced concrete. And you have the chhatris, the domes, and this kind of grill uh, with this sort of squares design. Um, the architect himself described it as Mughal Saracenic, whereas the more common terminology today is Indo Saracenic. Another very fine building in the same indo saracenic style is, is a building in Lucknow called Charbagh Station, the main station in Lucknow. It's got beautiful uh, canopies on top, uh, small domes all over the place, pointed arch, and a very impressive portico, very large and impressive uh, portico, and good facilities inside. The architect was John Hanneman. <coughs> it was opened in 1926, just after the Awad and Rohilkhand Railway, who had sort of planned and designed the station, had transferred the station to the East Indian Railway. 
Another fine station in the same style is uh, is Kanpur, still still in use. Um, uh, uh, it's got these beautiful vertically elongated uh, domes, and you can see it with a ribbed design. It has got this recessed window. Uh, in the tympana of these arches, you have got uh, open work screens to protect from the sun. Similar are these railing designs. So it's a very fine building. And uh, uh, this was one of the last buildings built in the Indo-Saracenic designs in 1930. We now come to princely states who continued in the Indo-Saracenic style and they built some very fine stations. Although small, but attractive. Now, this is a station which was exclusively built for the Maharaja of Alwar. It was built, it was designed by a gentleman known as Tikaram, who was the chief draftsman of the Rajputana Malwa Railway, formerly the chief draftsman. It's got this beautiful uh, this canopy or this pavilion on top with this Bangla style uh, cornice overhang beautiful columns. Um, you have these small chhatris on all sides. You have a zanana on the left uh, where, where the ladies could take rest, a restroom with a courtyard and on the right for men with a courtyard and a beautiful entrance gate uh, with a cusped arch. And one critique, uh, one, one, one sort of uh, chap called Havel, who wrote a book and he commented on this and he said, why can't more Indian railway stations have waiting rooms on their roofs? Which was, uh, which was a rather far-fetched idea, but nonetheless expressed by him. This is a station called Morvi in Saurashtra. It was a small state run by Thakurs who later became Maharajas, very enlightened rulers. They built bridges, palaces, secretariat, power stations, and so on. They also built a very large narrow gauge network. And you can see the station has these beautiful, beautiful cornices, harem windows, corner pavilions. As a young officer, when I joined the railways, I was posted at Rajkot. And I would often go to uh, uh, Morvi on inspection. And you find you had this huge station with barely 15 passengers. On its, uh, on its platforms. So it was, uh, Morvi was a small town then. Today it is a center of, you know, the clock industry, but uh, extremely beautiful station. Um, this is a, a, a station which the Nawab of Rampur built for himself and his sort of family. Again, the same Zanana, Mardana, the, the use of minarets, these lovely pavilions, and so on. This building still exists, but is in ruin. What happened is after partition, whereas the most of the railway was taken over by the Indian government, the Maharaja decided to retain this siding, saloon siding, with himself. And in their sort of inheritance squabbles, the building has got totally neglected. It is currently a stand for motorcycles uh, and it is, in, it is in very bad shape and one feels like weeping when one actually sees it. But all Maharajas did not build uh, in the Indo-Saracenic style. This is a Travancore Strait, Trivandrum Station, uh, Tiravantapuram, uh, where the Rani decided to adopt the uh, um, classical theme. So there's a lot of classical influence in this particular building, again, built in the 1930s uh, uh, by the state of Travancore. Another extremely beautiful station uh, with, with its sort of rustic charm is Mysore station. Um, this is what it looked like originally. If you go to Mysore today, you won't recognize it. But at the heart of the present building is the same build, is the same thing. The, the tiled roofs are there, 
but on one side they have uh, given it a, a sort of classical appearance with big verandas with uh, a large number of columns they have put a clock tower in the center so it it, it looks nothing like this but the at the core of the structure the building is the same so the lovely uh, lovely building I now come to the uh, early 20th century where major changes were taking place. Instead of looking backwards like the Romanesque and classical and Gothic, people now started having original ideas, original thoughts. There was innovation in architecture. What were its characteristics? Use of new materials, reinforced concrete, steel frames, ribbed windows, horizontal lines, flat roofs, very little ornamentation, open plan interiors, well lit, you got a feeling of space and the use of externally of white or neutral shades. The main proponents uh, of this style in the West were Walter Gropius in Germany, Corbusier in France and Frank Lloyd Wright in the United States. And at the same time, you got this art deco element also coming up. So the impact on railway buildings was that you had a very minimal, minimalistic uh, style that was introduced. Examples, this is a Nagpur station, designed by the architect of the GIPR. He called this building English classic. And uh, this is the day of its inauguration. Uh, <clears throat> construction started in 1913, was completed in January 25, um, uh, cost four and a half lakhs this building, but it still continues to serve the station even today. An observation made at that time and even, even through today was this very small forecourt uh, so there was very limited parking available and that continues to be a problem. Uh, a problem a hundred years later. Pune station built in about the same time, inaugurated July 25. Um, main difference being this was given a, a pitched roof. And see the width of the platform. We are talking about space. Look at this width of this platform. You have very few stations with such wide platforms. And that's again another reason why it continues to serve uh, the people of Pune a hundred years later. Another fine station with the closure of Kulaba. A new station was opened at Bombay Central, Bilasis Road. Uh, the architect was Claude Batley, who, had, who was a professor of architecture and also set up a company. A very simple and elegant design, uniform horizontal row of windows, distinctive glazed central arch, the central hall was very well lit and ventilated. <coughs> uh, and there is a slight art deco element with these vertical uh, panels on both sides with open work screens. I don't know, at the end of the presentation, I'll show you a picture of what it was like in January 2022, which actually shocked me. In the same, you know, in this uh, early 20th uh, century, you got a Bombay mainline station at uh, CSTM, Victoria Terminal. Entirely different and probably a little incongruous from the old uh, Gothic building. You can see the shadow of this Gothic building on the road. But nonetheless, a fine building. Um, you again had reinforced concrete, uh, very nice pillars, beams, and so on. And this is the dining room, uh, the, the catering uh, sort of dining hall at that time. And probably at least 20 years back, I think that sideboard was still there. Uh, again, in the 1930s, you got this building uh, at Trichy. Um, again, classical elements, um, three well-defined large arches in the main hall. 
uh, Roman arcade below. Uh, classical style uh, rustic rustication on the walls. White color. Later on, they have made it, uh, they put in other colors, but uh, originally it was simple white. And it had very good facilities. Uh, um, it had subways instead of foot over bridges. And uh, this work was carried out along with a lot of remodeling in the yard. Now, I've been following up till now a timeline. I'm now going to deviate. I'm going to cover other types of buildings. Um, uh, uh, general offices of company railways. You know, we had a large number of companies running the railways in India, like, like the GIP railway, the BBNCI, the East Indian, and so on. So some of their offices were fine buildings. So this building on the right here is the office of the East Indian Railway at Fairy Place in Calcutta. The architect was Roskill Baines, who was a sort of an architect of the railway itself. This cornice on top is modeled on the Farnese Palace in Rome. The Farnese Palace in Rome is a famous building, uh, which belonged to one of those very rich popes uh, in, in Rome. And Michelangelo had actually played a role in designing the, the, uh, this cornice in that particular building. So he has borrowed that from there. Uh, there was in these semicircular areas, there was a, a relief works called scrafito, scrafito work depicting com commerce, um, agriculture and, and, and such like themes. But it's a very fine uh, building otherwise. It was another aspect of the building which I think is worth mentioning is that it was built on top of the original Fort William in Calcutta. On the northwest and northeast bastions of this fort, these were the, the northwest uh, bastion was one through which Siraj Dola attacked the fort. The black hole of Calcutta was located within this precinct. Uh, very close to this building, which is the general post office. And uh, Roskill Baines had been given the objective by uh, Lord Curzon to try and locate the black hole of Calcutta. And he put in a very great effort, although he was not able to get the exact location. But it is built on the, on the old Fort William. This is, these are the head offices of the Bengal Nagpur Railway in Calcutta. Um, uh, again, the architect is the same Vincent Esh, who was an employee of the railway. He did the Hyderabad meter gate station, which I mentioned. And again, these uh, British architects did a lot of experimentation. This is the original design, which is basically a classical building. But towards the end, he started putting in these, you know, these Bangla style eaves. He started playing around with these lanterns design here. And he then described it as Indo-Saracenic, which it is not. It is a classical design building. And if you go inside, it has got very stylized uh, ionic pillars and a beautiful balustrade going up to the general manager's office. Another headquarter building is this one, which is uh, in the Indo-Saracenic uh, design um of, of the madras and southern maratha railway in chennai uh, you can see again these uh, the design of eaves domes and very stylized sort of chatris shall i put it that way and and these awnings above the windows the southern maratha railway in 1908 merged with the Madras Railway. Its original head office was in Dharwar. And this was their uh, sort of office building, which is sort of a typical British colonial office building. But uh, uh, once they abandoned it, it was handed over to uh, a college. And today the Karnataka Arts College is still located in this building. And SMR offices is still written on the building. 
the the railways was this was built in 18 in the 1880s. Uh, 150 years later, has been was invited to do some renovation and repair this clock, and the railways obliged. So it's a it's a it's a fine old railway building with a beautiful sunken garden. This is a, a recent building opened in 1936, post independence. I thought I should mention it. It is Baroda House. Baroda House is the headquarters of Northern Railway. It was the palace of the Maharaja of Baroda and Delhi. When New Delhi was built, the British permitted the Maharajas to build their palatial buildings around India Gate. And this one was designed by Edwin Lutyens himself. He made the initial design while sitting in a train. And because it was around a circle, it had a trapezoidal plot. Therefore, for the trapezoidal plot, he built this butterfly-shaped building. And uh, I mean, I have worked as general manager of Northern Railway. And if you see this, sorry, if you see this, this room here, this was the general manager's office which originally was the Maharani's bedchamber. So one wing belonged to the Maharaja, the other belonged to the Maharani, and the general manager's office was in the Maharani's bedroom. Well, let's talk of some other buildings. And I'll, go, I'll try and go through a little more quickly. This is Ahmedabad station, where uh, 16th century minarets meet uh, 19th century technology. It was only a, a large shed opened in 1863. Uh, uh, it, it had a platform and still has with double discharge facilities. And behind this platform is the actually the fortified city behind the entrance to the station. And that fortified city has now become a world heritage site. This is Dehradun station, a charming station with the backdrop of the Masuri Hills the eye. Uh, uh, the station still survives. Um, very nice stone masonry facade, corner coins, tall chimneys, and so on. This is Bangalore station, uh, Bangalore, Bang Bangalore City, built by the Mysore State Railway and opened in 1882. Now you find this ridge and furrow arrangement for the platform shed and the traffic managers on top. I, re I went to think about seven, eight years back to Bangalore, and I was surprised to find that this still exists, including this, this room on top. Uh, it, it, is, it is still there. How much is it? It's, it's an almost 150, 140 years. I thought I should show you something from the Northeast. This is a place called Haflong, located in the Kachar Hills. The Assam Bengal Railway built a line from Chittagong to Tinsukia. And their construction offices and survey offices were located at Haflong in these hills. One major problem was actually building, uh, building that railway line because there was no labor there. So they had to get 25,000 labor from all over India. There were Pathan rock cutters, there were Punjabi uh, masons, there were people from the central uh, uh, tribal districts of India. There were bridge builders from Bombay, and there were all kinds of beasts of burden which were used, elephants, camels, bullocks, in building this line. There were very major operations since facilities were very few. And you have these beautiful thatched, uh, this became a railway town. The railways had its own, own school and shops, etc., etc. And to some extent, it is today the headquarter of the, I think, South Kachar District Council. And you had these beautiful thatched uh, bungalows located uh, in uh, Haflong. This is a very old picture which I got from the British Library of Sialda Station around 1860s. And the architect was Sir Walter Granville, who did the, the Calcutta Post Office later, the Calcutta High Court later, became the chief architect through the government. Uh, it was described then as Italian style of oriental architecture. There were six platforms here. 
uh, uh, and the design is said to have been based on Nineveh and Khorsabad uh, in, uh, in the Middle East, Mesopotamia. Uh, so it's an interesting uh, story about this uh, particular building. This is a picture of the during the Second World War. What they have kept doing is they have kept changing the outside facade. This is another fascinating building. It is called Fraser Koti. It is uh, the Northern Railway's construction office in Delhi, just outside Red Fort near Kashmiri Gate. Uh, the palace of Shah Jahan's uh, Kurdish nobleman, Ali Mardan Khan, who was governor of Kashmir, Kabul, uh, and Lahore, built a palace here. <coughs> the basement of the building still survives. It has got two or three tiers of rooms underneath, beautifully furnished rooms with three secret tunnels going out. The British took this over in the early part of the 19th century, around 1805. And in 1819, a Colonel Robert rebuilt this house. Uh, uh, and it became the Koti of the British resident. And the most famous resident of this, of this uh, house was a chap called William Fraser. He was a white Mughal. He spoke fluent Persian. He married uh, uh, Indian ladies, had Indian concubines. Uh, he was a patron of Ghalib. And there is a famous Fraser album of paintings which he had, which he had collected. Unfortunately, he was murdered uh, in his lifetime. But this is a really a very unique building. The dome came up later. The dome has come up later. It has won a few sort of heritage awards in this particular building. But its story is, uh, is fascinating. So you have both Mughal and 19th century uh, British architecture built into this small coating. Another aspect which has taken my fancy are pitched roofs and gables. I mean, uh, you know, because a lot of, uh, it's a very common design, relatively inexpensive, can be styled in many ways, a popular form used in railway station building. And uh, some of the terminology, this is a simple gable roof, this is a hip gable where you have slopes on all sides, this is cross gable where you have gables in two directions meeting, uh, a cross hip roof and this is cross gable roof. This is a gablet roof where you have this small, uh, where the slope changes of the roof. This is a Dutch gable which you often find in South Africa and in Holland. And this is called a clipped gable or a jerkin head gable. And we'll see examples of some of these. This is a building in Bombay which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It's the Central Railway Hospital was originally built by James Trubshaw as Elphinstone College, 1867 to 71. Later became the uh, Victoria Jubilee Technical Institute and uh, was taken over by the railways in 1924. GIP Railway did not have a hospital and they complained to the railway board that a lot of their staff was malingering and getting sick certificates from private doctors. And that became their main case for getting a hospital, apart from getting more experience for their own doctors. So very reluctantly in 1924, the railway board agreed to convert this into a hospital. It's a, to my mind, a very magnificent building. All the types of roof designs that I have told you are actually can be found in this building and it has got this magnificent central tower. This is Bilaspur station. It's one with uh, the Dutch gables that you find. Um, where you have this gable face on the outside of the, actually the gable. Um, it has beautiful moldings. Um, it's got the diamond shaped window panes, fine verge board. These are verge boards or barge boards. So, very fine verge boards. Uh, this is Mangalore Station, 1907. Again, you find this ridge and furrow design for the platform. 
uh, shed. Um, got this port crosshair and this cross cable station building. This is a beautiful building which was in Quetta, now in Pakistan. And you can see what a clipped gable or a jerkin head gable is. This is a jerkin head gable. You got lovely dormers. Very nice fascia. Fascia is this portion of the, the roof, which stands out. Uh, unfortunately, it was destroyed in 1935 in an earthquake. This is, a, in 1903, Travancore was very keen on a railway line. So they got a terminus at uh, Quilon, Colum. And uh, this building was built in with Kerala style architecture. These big shaped gables are typical of Kerala style architecture. Although from region to region within Kerala, there are variations. But this was a building built entirely in the local style of architecture. Uh, it has got the distinctive dormers and uh, and uh, gablets. The gablets. Unfortunately, I mean, till about 10, 15 years, 20 years back, it was still there. Parts of it was still there. It has now disappeared. I think I have, am I overshooting my time? I want, I can stop and, or do you want me to continue? Um. How much longer do you think that'd be, uh, Mr. Mathur? Another 10, 10 minutes or so. Um, if everyone's okay, I think, uh, yeah, sure. Sure? Yeah. Okay. Brief mention of mountain railways of India. Uh, uh, the mountain railways of India are also a world heritage site, but uh, the, uh, are, the stations are not their reason for becoming world heritage site. It is how they actually tackle the very stiff gradients. Gradients, In this case, in Darjeeling Himalayan Railway, it was loops and zigzags. Um, it was the apt system where in the center of the rail on the Nilgiri line, you had uh, uh, sort of sprockets coming out. It was a cog and wheel arrangement and, the, and there was a wheel on the, on the locomotive which engaged these, uh, these cogs. And eventually, uh, it it stopped the trend from rolling back. But these are some of the stations on that line, pretty station. Similarly, you have the Kalka Simla line. Here, the gradient was tackled through tunnels. There were originally 107 tunnels. Now, I think 103 were made. And they had this, again, ridge and furrow arrangement at all stations on the roof, depending on the size of the station. This is Kandaghat. This is Barog. And in this station, there is only one. Now, individual companies had their own styles. Um, uh, the East Indian Railway built uh, their platform sheds over a single line and the platform. And they had a massive arcade on, on, on one side, whereas the roof rested on the main building on the other side. So you can see Jamalpur. This, of course, is no more. Ilabad also no more. Itawa, it is still there. Um, this is the Delhi section of the Northwestern Railway, where you have this same thing on uh, uh, the platform shed on two platforms. And a, a very interesting uh, segmented corrugated iron roof structure with these sort of barrel shaped uh, roofs on top. On the Rajputana Malwa Railway Ahmedabad section, you had stations with domes. This is Abu Road, Sidpur, Sojat Road, Kalol, Mahsana, Iqbalgar, Palanpur. All these stations had uh, dome roofs. They kept it cool, and even the even the gate lodges had a similar design. This is the De Delhi Ambala Kalka Railway, which had this sort of gablet roof design at all stations. Very pretty station with these cast iron uh, sort of gates and railings. Kurukshetra, Chandi Mandir near Chandigarh, and Lal Roo. Um, this is uh, on the Nagda to Mathra section. 
two stations, Kota Junction and Shamgarh. Um, uh, again, uh, elements of Indo-Saracenic with these small chhatris on top. Um, and it also blends with the sort of sur surrounding environment, which is a very rugged desert-like environment. Now, training institutes and bungalows, brief mention. Uh, very few of you would know that the railway staff college was initially in Dehradun from 1928 to 1930. It was then handed over to the Indian Military Academy. Today, this building is known as Chetwood Hall. And uh, the, the sunken area in the center of this hall was the model room where model trains used to run. Um, uh, and these are photographs from, from that era. Today, this is a lecture hall, an important room in that. We have another very fine railway staff college, which started in 1952-53, which is the Pratap Vilas Palace. Architect Charles Stevens, son of Frederick Stevens, who did the uh, CSTM. Um, it was built for a small prince, a small child. So if you see, go to the director's room, you have got paintings of you know, children's streams of animals and birds and so on. And uh, I remember I was on the faculty here for four years. And uh, the principal at that time, because this is a copper dome, he got the copper dome, the oxidized layer removed, and it used to look beautiful with the copper glistening in the, in the sun. Uh, that style is known as the Renaissance Revival style. This is the uh, institutes. Institutes in the railways are basically clubs for our senior supervisory staff. If they have, they used to have and still have excellent sports facility, billiards, tennis, um, a dance floor, um, shooting, hockey field, cricket field, library, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And because these uh, our railway towns were in sort of very lonely places sort of the social life ran around these institutes. And you had some very fine institutes like the Durand Institute in uh, Asansol, now Vivekananda Institute, built in the Gothic, influenced by the Gothic architectural style. You have the Mechanics Institute or European Institute at Jamalpur, built in the classical style and one in Calcutta. Um, these are bungalows, which will give you a sort of feel of bungalow evolution in India. This is a bungalow in Jamalpur in 1860s. You can see how crude and rough it is. Um, it, this bungalows were just evolving. This Asansol bungalow is today the divisional railway manager's house. It was the district engineer's bungalow. This was the local superintendent, local, uh, local superintendent's uh, bungalow in Jamalpur, destroyed in 1934 earthquake. But again, people use their own quirks and styles for building these bungalows. He's put a sort of platform shed on top of the roof. This, this bungalow still exists in Kharagpur. It is the chief mechanical engineer's house, huge house. Today, four people stay, four different families stay in that house. And uh, this is a chief draftsman bungalow. And what is at the bottom is a typical bungalow as it finally evolved in uh, Mau, which has now been handed over to the army. Um, so bungalow design on the railways has also evolved over time. This is post-independence. These were the typical designs after independence. You found this grid pattern um, with RCC becoming available. So this is uh, Ahmedabad, bottom is Bangalore. Uh, Officers still follow their quirks. In, in Katak, they have built one uh, shaped like a fort because Katak has a famous fort. In Agartala, which is a new station, they imitate, try to imitate the local uh, palace of the Maharaja. This is Bombay, which I told you was a very simple and elegant design. But I don't know. Uh, I'd like to know from you whether it is still like this because in January, 
it was painted up uh, in the very peculiar uh, color because paint is now easily available. And I'm sure Claude Batley, who designed the building, would be sort of turning in his grave. <coughs> um, this is the shape of things to come. The next generation of stations, which is Habib Ganj, is got a, a, a new name, Rani Alawati uh, Station. So the new stations are going to have a lot of glass and aluminum and so on. And I think uh, things are changing as we introduce more and more world-class stations. Thank you. I stop here. Thank you, Mr. Mathur. Thank you so much uh, for that really interesting talk and all the really lovely pictures. Um, I think our audience has really enjoyed that. Uh, we have a couple of questions. I'm just going to go through them quickly. So uh, one is just, uh, Ritika is asking, didn't Chisholm uh, also design the palace in Baroda? Yes, you're right. He did a number of buildings in Baroda. He did, gave, he did the palace in Baroda. There's a Khanderao market in Baroda. There is a museum in Baroda. There are the courts in Baroda. So he did a lot of work in Baroda. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, Sabira has asked a, a couple of questions. One is the first one is is the dome on top of CST? Uh, why is that called Indo Saracenic? The dome on CST is not Indo, Indo Saracenic, it's simply a dome. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, uh, but there is Indo Saracenic in, in the Western Railway offices, BBNCI offices. There are a lot of, uh, there are a very large number of domes. And therefore, you can say that it is a blend of uh, Victorian, Gothic, and Indo Saracen. Okay. Uh, her other question was also was the peacocks supposed to represent India and the lion, the British crown? On the gates of the building of uh, CSTM, as you enter the offices, there is a lion on one side and a tiger on the other. The lion represents Britain, uh, the tiger represents India. Okay. And her last question was, isn't Kolaba station now the Navy office? No, the Kolaba station is no more. It was... Uh, okay. Uh, it is where Badwar Park is currently located. That's right. Okay. Uh, Nupur had a question. Uh, what happened to the main Jabalpur station? And at some some point in time, uh, it was probably a new station was built there. Okay. I really don't have the full details, but uh, it doesn't exist anymore. Okay, and Dr. Sengupta said that you had spoken about the uh, garden reach and the, um, I think the uh, place where the person stays. But what about the SE railway headquarter building? Not the GM's residence. I think you spoke about the GM's residence. I also spoke about the BNR railway headquarters. Yes, yes. I did show, I did show the building. It was designed by Vincent H. It was built in about the, in the, uh, I think the late 18, 1880s. And uh, it was designed on the classical style. But while he was finishing it, uh, he put in a number of Indian flourishes and elements uh, and then described the building as Indo Saracen. But uh, the building was there. I might have gone through it very quickly. But it was... no, 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 that's fine. I think we did mention that he, you had shown that, but uh, anyway, he just wanted to double check. Um, Vidhi had a question out of all the stations in India, which is your favorite? Well, it has to be the. Uh... CSTM has to be CSTM, the headquarters and the and the terminal station, because there's nothing nothing like that. I showed you that stairwell, looking up. Yes. The star chamber, uh, <clears throat> and the very elaborate and beautiful ornamentation of that building is really remarkable. It it really is quite fantastic. Yes. Um, Nandini had a question as to why are the roofs called pitched roofs? Well, a sloped roof is called a pitched roof because it has a pitch to it. Has a... 
Okay. Slope, slope to it. So the normal time use is a pitch two. Okay. Um, and Mita wanted to know in, in Indo Saracenic, what would be the Indian part and what would be the Saracenic part? I think it is one uh, it is derived from the Indian. I mean, I don't think you can segregate the two. Yes. Because these buildings were, were this, the, these designs were adopted in India. Mm -hmm. That is Indo, Indo, and because there were Saracenic or Islamic elements to it, Indo Saracenic. I don't think you can segregate it. Right, right. I understand. Because, okay. because uh, if you look, I mentioned that they have used uh, in the South Indian uh, Indo Saracenic building, they use South Indian brackets, for example. Mm. So they are both Hindu and Islamic elements to it. Correct, correct. Okay, uh, Farooq had a question about the statue at Victoria. There used to be a statue of Victoria at uh, the VT terminus, and would you know where that is now? I don't know. Okay. Nandini says that the Baobab tree near the Kolaba railway station still stands at Bhadbaj Park. And um, Commander Mohan Narayan is asking uh, Was RK Narayan's fictitious Malgudi station? based on the Mysore station? It is based on a station which actually exists, but it is not Mysore. Okay. Uh, Mita has a question. What type of architecture that has been actually best for Indian? Uh, may I ask everyone to mute, please? Thank you. Uh, what type of architecture that has been influenced by other countries works best for the Indian climate? I know the Indian climate, I think the, 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 the British realized early <coughs> that their designs which they had in London and other cities of UK was not suitable. So I think uh, the biggest contribution was the veranda. Hmm. You know, the veranda and the you know, corridors in these office buildings they made a very, very big difference in order to adapt to the Indian climate. And you particularly see this in bungalow architecture, where, uh, you know, you had these very large verandas, sometimes going all around the house, or sometimes in the, in the front portion with the protruding drawing room. So the veranda, addition of the veranda to traditional bungalows was a major contribution. Okay, thank you. Um, one or two more things. Uh, Srinivas has said, I think that uh, Malgudi was based on Agumbe station in Karnataka. That's uh, his take on that. And um, the last question which from uh, Tejasuni, which is also my question, is uh, conservation of these you know, really beautiful structures is very, very important. And who is actually, uh, you know, looking into that? What more can be done? Um, that was my question as well as they just winnings. I think that's a very important question. Uh, clearly, we are not doing as much as we should. Uh, the, the railways, people in the railways are railway men. They know how to run railways. They're not good at conservation. Mm. Uh, but uh, I think uh, the railway should get organizations like INTAC involved. They have already done an identification exercise of identifying heritage buildings. But yeah. I think uh, uh, conservation requires a certain amount of investment. I mean, that call has to be taken by someone. So, yeah. And other than that, we've had a lot of uh, comments on how, what a fantastic uh, presentation this was and thanking you very much for it. And uh, everyone has really enjoyed your talk. So on behalf of Khaki as well, I would like to thank you very much. It was truly wonderful and wonderful to see all those beautiful buildings as well. Uh, yes, I think everyone yeah. enjoyed it very much. Thank, thank, you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.